Hello and welcome back to The Effect. It's been a long time since I've made any videos for the book, uh, but there is a new second edition coming out soon, or perhaps already out if you have seen this, uh, and that has a new chapter, and therefore we need some new videos to go along with that chapter on partial identification. So what is partial identification? So uh, when we are doing causal analysis and doing causal inference, we have to do a couple of things. We have to have some data, of course, but we also have to have a model of the world. Right? We have to have some understanding of how the world works so that we can draw our causal diagram. Uh, and generally, when we draw our causal diagram, it will tell us certain back doors that we have that we need to close. And we might be able to do that by controlling for variables in order to close those back doors or using some sort of quasi-experimental design like instrumental variables or regression discontinuity. Uh, but in each of those cases, there are certain assumptions that we need to make uh, about the relationships in the data. Otherwise, things won't work. Right. If we are going to try to close all of the back doors by controlling for stuff, we need to assume that we have measured and controlled for every single variable that we need to close all of the back doors. Uh, if we are going to use something like an instrumental variable, we need to assume that there is no front door path either between the instrumental variable and the outcome. Or with difference in differences, we need to assume that the parallel trends hold. Uh, all these sorts of assumptions that we need to be there. We need to have them be true if we want to use that approach to causally identifying the effect that we are interested in. So here's the problem. Do we actually believe all of those assumptions? Right? It's actually a pretty strong assumption to say that not only have I found and controlled for some of the variables on the back doors that we need to close in order to identify our effect, but we've identified, we've identified and closed all of those back doors. Right? There's nothing left open. Uh, the relationship uh, between the treatment variable that we're interested in and the outcome, uh, other than the things that we've already closed down, is literally zero. There's nothing left. That's a pretty strong assumption. A strong assumption is assuming more of the world than a weak assumption, right? We are sort of having to make more things that we assume in order to be true. So for example, let's say that I'm thinking about, you know, waking up tomorrow uh, and I am thinking about the sun rising. Uh, if I assume that the sun is going to rise tomorrow, that's a pretty weak assumption, right? It's probably true. Uh, if I assumed that and made that part of my analysis of what I'm going to do tomorrow, then you would probably believe me and not really question that. If I assume that the sun is going to rise between 6 and 7 a.m. tomorrow, that is a slightly stronger assumption, right? I'm assuming more about the world. Even if I have a really good basis for believing why I think it's going to rise between 6 and 7 in the morning, it is still a stronger assumption than saying that it's going to rise at all. I'm assuming more of the world. Further, if I assume that it is going to rise at 6.52 a.m. tomorrow, that is still, again, a stronger assumption, right? The more that I am assuming, the stronger my assumptions are. Now, of course, the stronger your assumptions are, the more you can get out of your analysis. If I'm willing to assume that there literally is no open backdoor path between my treatment and my outcome, that lets me get away with a lot of stuff, right? I mean, if I just assume that my treatment is randomly assigned, which is a very strong assumption, then I can just look at the relationship between my treatment and my outcome. I don't need to do anything. I can treat it like an experiment. Nothing stopping me. It's just going to be wrong if my assumption is wrong. And the stronger my assumption is, the more likely it is to be wrong, right? If I say that the sun is going to rise at 6.52 a.m. tomorrow, I'm more likely to be wrong than if I say that it's going to rise between 6 and 7. And even then, I'm more likely to be wrong than if I say it's going to rise at all. So we have this problem. The stronger of assumptions that we are willing to make, the more we can get out of our results. Um, and the more we can say about our causal analysis, but also the more likely we're going to be basing our analysis on incorrect assumptions. So what do we do, right? I mean, if you want to use instrumental variables, you have to assume that your instrument is valid. If you want to control for stuff to identify your effect, you have to assume that you control for everything. So, I mean, do you just not do any of these analyses? No, that's where partial identification comes in. Partial identification says, we are going to take an analysis that requires a strong assumption, and then we are going to weaken that assumption. And we're going to allow for the fact that this maybe means that we don't get quite as precise an answer, but we still get an answer. And now we can more responsibly talk about how we think our assumptions are likely to be true or false. So going back to the sun rising example, let's say that I would like to get up tomorrow, maybe five or 10 minutes before the sun rises so that I can watch it rise. Very nice, right? Well, if I assume that it's going to rise at exactly 6.52 a.m., I know exactly when I need to wake up. I need to wake up 
10 minutes before that at 6.42 a.m. precisely. I can tell you precisely when I need to wake up. That is called point identification. If I've made enough assumptions that the answer to the question I'm looking for has exactly one answer, that is called point identification. On the other hand, if I make a slightly weaker assumption, I can still come to a conclusion, but I might not be having as precise a conclusion. If I'm only willing to say that it rises between six and seven, well, then when should I get up? Well, sometime between uh, 5.50 a.m. and 6.50 a.m. Again, I can still come to a conclusion. It still tells me that I shouldn't wake up at noon if I want to catch the sunrise, but I have a range of assumptions. This is also called set identification in addition to partial identification because you get a set of answers in your results. Now, partial identification is something that I think is very powerful and underutilized. We have a problem in causal inference where, you know, the stuff that we really believe in the results of are often these quasi experiments, right? Things that require us to have some sort of instrumental variable or discontinuity for regression discontinuity uh, or something like that, right? Uh, but the problem is that if we are relying on that and we say that we don't really trust the analyses that require us to just control for a bunch of variables uh, because we can never be sure that we've controlled for everything, that's a problem because you can only do quasi experiments if the quasi-experiment happened. It really limits the range of things that you can study if you're always waiting for a quasi-experiment to pop up. On the other hand, there's a lot of stuff that you can do where you can pretty confidently say that you can control for a lot of the important stuff and close a lot of important backdoors just using control variables, but you know you can never quite get there. But with partial identification, you can say, well, I know that we're not going to quite get there, but given that we don't quite get all the way there, what can we say anyway? You can still often say quite a lot. You can still say something like, I think that the effect of this policy or whatever is between five and 10 percentage points, given the fact that I know I'm still a little bit biased. I've still got a couple of omitted variables. Let's do an example and in causal inference. Let's say we have a nice randomized experiment. All right. And I'm going to tell you, we're going to have a problem with this randomized experiment that even the randomization is not going to be able to solve. So we're going to randomly assign 5,000 parents to get a thousand dollars and say, hey, Parents, keep your kids in school. Here's a thousand dollars to help you do that. And then the other parents, we're not going to give them any money, right? So we randomly assign. We want to know what's the effect of giving the parents this money on keeping their kids in school. And then we follow them up later and we see whether their kids are still in school. Now, there is going to be a problem uh, that getting the money might make you more likely to stay in the study, whereas the people who never get any money at all, they might be more likely to never report back in with the researchers. And so we lose track of them. And so we're going to get differential attrition levels uh, between the people who got money and the people who don't. So at the end, if we see, for example, that the people who got money, uh, they have a higher share of kids who are still in school. Is that because the money was effective or is it just because the money made different kinds of people more willing to drop out of the study? And so we get a wrong answer. We have a collider bias problem demonstrated by this diagram right here. Now, what can we do is we can't actually observe any of the people who, who dropped out of the study. So we can't adjust for it by controlling for a variable or, variable or something like that. But here's what we can do. We think, well, what can we actually assume for certain? We could assume, for example, uh, that the people who dropped out of the study are basically just randomly picked, right? You just drop out of the study at random. It has nothing to do with whether you were likely to stay in school or not, uh, whether you were uh, randomized into the treatment or control group. It doesn't matter. And if that's the case, then we can just ignore the attrition problem and just report the results that we have. That's probably not true, right? That's a very strong assumption, even though it lets us get to a point identification, a single estimate of exactly what the effect of this money was. So let's go back to a weaker assumption. Let's try this assumption. I know that the share of students who stayed in school is somewhere between 0% and 100%. That seems pretty reasonable, right? Has to be true. So given that, I can look at the share of students who are in school at the end of the study and say, well, I know that a certain share of people dropped out. Uh, I know that the people who stayed in, a certain share of them keep the, keep their kids in school. And then the share who dropped out, that's the, I don't know that. I know how many people dropped out, but I don't know what share of those kids are still in school. But I know it's between zero and 100%. So if, for example, I know that 90% of people stayed in the study, 10% dropped out. Of the 90% that stayed in, 80% of them kept sending their kids to school. Of the 10% that dropped out, it's somewhere between zero and 100%. So if I plug in zero, that's the least share that it could possibly be if I had happened to observe those students. And I end up with a value of 0.72. 72% of people kept their kids in school. If I assume that everybody who dropped out of the study kept their kids in school, that tells me that 82% of them kept their kids in school. So I don't know exactly what share of people 
who were in the treatment group kept their kids in school, but it has to be somewhere between 72% and 82%. I can do the same sort of calculation on the control group, and this allows me to get a range of estimates based on that range that we end up with there from 0% to 100% gives us a range of treatment effects as well. So rather than having to pick between making an unrealistic assumption like people are dropping out at random or just not being able to report anything at all, I instead can give you a range of reasonable estimates based on what I know to be true about this population. Then simply it's a share. It has to be between zero and 100%. If I feel like I know more about the situation, then I can add more assumptions if I think that they are reasonable. Maybe, for example, I'm willing to assume that if you stayed in the study, you're probably also more likely to keep your kids in school. Right. Some of the people who dropped out of the study are just people who drop out of life in general and they don't send their kids to school. So if I'm willing to make that assumption, that again allows me to narrow the bounds. By adding more assumptions, I can narrow the bounds. And by allowing myself to not have to make those assumptions, to not have to get to point identification, I can choose which assumptions I think are reasonable rather than asking which assumptions do I have to make to get a point identification, whether or not they're true. So that's the basic idea behind partial identification. We know that there are strong assumptions that we could make that would allow us to get a precise estimate of what our treatment effect is in a causal inference context. But a lot of those assumptions are not true. And we don't want to have to make them. We also don't want to have to throw up our hands and go home and say, I can't do it. I can't make this assumption. And therefore, I can't give you an answer. I can just make the assumptions that I think are reasonable. And based on the assumptions I think are reasonable, I can narrow down the range of plausible estimates to a range that I can report to you. And I can say something like, the effect of this policy on states, people keeping their kids in school is somewhere between, let's say, 30% and 40% increase in the in the rate, right? Whatever it happens to be, as many assumptions as I'm willing to be confidently able to add. All right, that is it. Uh, and in the next couple of videos, I'm going to show you some different methods that you can use for applying this idea of partial identification. Thank you. Mm -hmm.